Good afternoon, this is British National Party Television reporting from Colne, Lancashire. Today, local party activists are conducting a day of action. They're intermingling with the public, uh, giving out literature, explaining our policies and listening to local concerns. And it's got to be said that so far we've been extremely well received. And we are lucky today because we're joined by the chairman of the British National Party, Mr Nick Griffin, MEP. Good afternoon, Mr Hello. Griffin. Hello. Uh, now, I believe that today is, could really be considered an extracurricular activity to, for you because you're in the middle of a, a nationwide speaking tour and this particular event is a part of that uh, tour. I was wondering if you'd like to tell our viewers how uh, the tour is going, how, how it's progressing. It's going really well. Um, we started last Saturday. Uh, I've been sort of all around the country, starting in the Midlands uh, and then round down the southwest, southeast, East Anglia, Yorkshire. Uh, tonight will be, I think, the ninth meeting that I've done. Uh, by the end of the tour tomorrow, uh, I'll have done 12 full meetings uh, and several sort of lunch meetings for small numbers of people as well. Uh, that's as well as having separate meetings with local activists uh, who are putting out my literature uh, that I produce as an MEP, for instance, to Save Our Seals campaign. Uh, so it's been very busy and in between the meetings uh, and the, the planning sessions uh, it's events like this to get out and meet the public. We are a very busy man Mr Griffin. Now I'd like to raise two specific issues which are causing considerable concern here in the North West. Firstly the case of Charlene Downs. Now I know you've been a keen supporter of the campaign to persuade the authorities to uh, hold a retrial of the two Muslim men who many people believe are responsible for the murder of young Charlie. Indeed, I believe you recently raised the topic at uh, the European Parliament. I was wondering if you could tell our viewers why you think it, uh, a retrial is justified in this particular case. A retrial is justified for the alleged killers of Charlene Downs uh, precisely because the, uh, the alleged killers of Stephen Lawrence. There was a retrial. So how come it's okay for one community, but not for the other? That's the core yeah, of it. Yeah. There has to be a legal reason for a retrial. Uh, and I've spoken to a number of people with you know, direct experience uh, of the way in which, for instance, uh, the jury was got at. Uh, there's clear evidence that one of the jury members uh, was quite a close friend of one of the defendants. Certainly later, there's easily enough evidence there, prima facie evidence, for the police to investigate and they've only got to get one scrap of fresh evidence uh, or uh, a pointer that the jury in some way was corrupted and they're absolutely entitled to have a retrial. The fact is when you look at the way that the police have treated, for instance, Charlene's mum and grandma, both of whom have been arrested for going on perfectly legal demonstrations calling for justice for their family, you can see that the police and the authorities, the Crown Prosecution Service and so on, simply don't want to know. They want, although there's no body, they want the case buried. So it's keep pushing in We've got to keep pushing. Uh, it's about this family, it's about justice for Charlene, but it is part of a bigger picture of the way in which the establishments are still covering up the extent of Muslim gang grooming of young girls. And the reason I say cover up, because there has been some news about it, they're still not mentioning the key issue. They say these girls are groomed with cigarettes, uh, with alcohol and with drugs. They don't mention the truth of it. This is heroin. It's part of the heroin jihad Absolutely. against our people. Until they admit that, it's a cover up. And the second issue I'd like to raise is the case of the elderly lady in Rotherham, mm -hmm. who has been a victim of a particularly vicious and sustained campaign, which has included vandalism and uh, verbal abuse which many people believe is motivated uh, out of a desire to get her to leave her home uh, because it's close to the mosque. Mm -hmm. Now I know that uh, you personally have um, funded um, certain security yeah. equipment, CCTV cameras etc etc. Mm -hmm. Is there any more the party can do to help protect this old lady? Well we're still working on it. Um, what we've done is enough to protect her if the police will follow it up. Just the other day, uh, in fact, within a few days of the latest equipment being put in, uh, someone, someone went up and smashed it up. Uh, and the CCTV apparently, because the police were around there like a shot and got the CCTV footage, they said they couldn't afford to put their own in, which I do not believe. And I believe the reason they've taken it is so that we haven't got it. They con basically conned their way in. 
to get this footage, but they have told us that it clearly shows uh, a, a masked man in an Asian style or Palestinian style uh, scarf around his face going up and smashing the equipment with a hammer. There's other CT CCTV uh, equipment in the area, standard council stuff and so on. Uh, so I've very little doubt that if the police check that, they will see somewhere down the road the same man in a very distinctive T-shirt having taken his mask off yeah. and they yeah. can arrest him. Yeah, absolutely. So what's, what needs to be done has been done if the police now do their duty. If they don't, then yes, there is more that we have to do. So our people have already been, uh, the equipment's been replaced or repaired yet again. Uh, and if the police won't take action, we're going to have to start pointing the finger where the blame now really lies, not just with the culprits, but with the authorities for covering this up. It's an important case because it's not a one-off. The harassments and victimisation and pure naked racism this poor lady faces is faced by many, many people, individuals and families living in similar areas because time and time again you hear this, it's a low-level campaign of ethnic cleans cleansing against our people. The same is done, I know has been done, say, against the Sikh community in Bradford, against the West Indian community in Birmingham. Wherever these people are in large numbers, they rub up against and victimise and push out their neighbours who aren't Muslims. It's going on and it's got to be stopped. And that nicely leads me on to uh, the question that I, I know many people want answering. Um, the case of Charlene Downs and the elderly lady are emblematic and symptomatic of problems that thousands of our people are experiencing mm -hmm. across the country at the hands of foreigners. And the common thread that seems to be running through them all is the total unwillingness of the state and the authorities mm -hmm. to intervene in crimes committed by non-Europeans upon Europeans. I was wondering if you'd like to tell our, our, our viewers what, why you think this is the case? Why do you think the authorities are so unwilling to become involved in these cases? There's a lot of reasons merging together. I think there's two that stand out. First of all, the, the British ruling class as a whole, they're, um, I wouldn't say they're the victims, but they suffer from a form of inverted racism. They're obsessed with the idea of racism, but they can't see that racism cuts both ways. And if it's uh, an English person victimising a foreigner, they're all over it like a rash, which is fair enough, because any kind of racist victimisation is wrong, providing it's a level playing field, providing it's treated fairly. But the simple fact is, when it's our people, they turn a blind eye. From what I've seen in Parliament, you know, being close to the same kind of people, I think they're actually incapable of seeing it. I don't think they even are doing it deliberately. Yeah. They simply do not believe racism is our fault. It's their fault. It's a white people's fault and so on. And so that's where it comes from. The second factor, especially when you're dealing with the Muslim population, is they've got a huge block vote. They deliver it to the politicians who deliver things to them. So that scares politicians. Uh, the uh, the left-wing media, people like the BBC and so on, they're fundamentally um, sympathetic to Islam because they're against Christianity, they're against Western colonialism as it was, so now the Muslims have been the victims, so now it's payback time. So there's that. And there's one final factor, especially for the police. They know perfectly well that a few minor incidents in 2001 created a series of Muslim riots, and it was riots in Muslim areas against the police, against the neighbours and so on. I saw this in Oldham. They created a series of Muslim riots which cost millions of pounds. And, um, you know, the, the Bradford riot, riot alone cost 20 million. Just enormous sums of money in damage. And they don't want the same thing happening, especially on their watch. And they know that the Muslim community at present, uh, they're, un they're very uh, angry about Western involvement in Middle Eastern countries. So the whole thing is volatile and they simply don't want trouble. So Rudyard Kipling wrote about it, uh, that you pay the Dane gelt to make the Danes go away. But as Kipling said, he who pays the Dane gelt never gets rid of the Dane. We're not dealing with Danes now. We're dealing with a huge a growing Muslim population in this country, which fundamentally doesn't like our values, has its own values, sees this country as something that needs to be conquered not all of them, many of them are perfectly nice, decent people. There's this thread running through Islam, and especially among the young Muslims on the streets. They're against our community, they're against our way of doing things, and they want space, they want houses, they want streets, they want more and more for themselves. They push and push, and if the police stand up against it, there's going to be a huge riot, so the police turn a blind eye and walk away.
And let me just see if I've got this straight. Are you saying that one of the reasons why the authorities are not protecting our people is that they are frightened of the Muslims? Yeah. Is that, is that I'm your belief? Absolutely so. When you consider that uh, when David Blunkett was Home Secretary back in the 2006 or so, he described community relations in Britain as being like a, a coiled spring of tension. Now, when you look at the increase in youth unemployment, which doesn't just affect our community, it does affect the Muslim community as well, and so on, so you've got that. You've got their anger over repeated wars, the continuing violence in Afghanistan, the Americans in particular using drones to kill huge numbers of people in Pakistan, uh, without, and I've got no time for those people in the Taliban, but um, using drones to murder people, execute people, just because you believe they may be a terrorist. Yeah. You can understand why young Muslims in this country, who identify with the home country very often, Pakistan, they identify with their Muslim brothers, they are very, very angry indeed. And you get little pointers to this, uh, for instance in Preston, not far from here, where a policeman in a heavily Muslim area was attacked and brutally beaten, hospitalised, by a gang, probably seven or eight men, and uh, the police have not revealed anything about who those men were. But I tell you what, if a gang of seven or eight young whites went into that part of Preston, there would be a race riot in any case. So it tells me that that was members of the local Muslim community attacking a policeman for what? It's a low-level intifada, a low-level resistance rebellion that's brewing in Britain. And the police think if we stay away from it, if we don't provoke them, if we let them do the things they want to do, perhaps we can keep it calm. They're sacrificing our young girls and our young lads and old ladies like that lady in Rotherham. They're sacrificing them on the altar of political correctness in order to keep the Muslim community quiet. I've got to say that is that is fascinating, Mr. Griffin. That really is interesting. He's got a lot of food for thought there. Uh, and I'd like to thank you for, for this interview. But before you go, I was wondering if you'd care to join me in a kebab. <laughs> uh, we'll give that a miss, but it's a fish and chip shop nearby. Let's right. go and do that. Let's do that. Thank okay. you, Mr. Thank Griffin. You. Thank you. Cheers.